Hi, everyone. Welcome to our special series for our summer kickoff. We're excited that you're here. Um, we're going to wait about one minute for people to, to connect and all join us. We've got quite a few people registered, so uh, they'll stroll in. But before we get going, I'll just do a little intro about myself, a um, little bit of housekeeping. Maybe you're, this is new for you to use GoToWebinar. I'm not too sure. It's worked out really well for us. Over the last year, we've been using it since COVID, and it's been an incredible way to share our messages and our programs with so many people around the province and right across the country and around the world. We've had people join us from all corners of the world, which is super exciting for us to, to share that message. Uh, I'm Sandra Riches, and I'm the Executive Director for the BC Adventure Smart Program. I'm really grateful to be joining you tonight from the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people. Uh, I'm also really grateful for our special guests tonight. Uh, this is new for us to have a, um, a kind of a table here and invite people in to share their perspectives, but you'll gain so much from them tonight um, and, and get some other insights that will give you some more perspective on your outdoor recreation, uh, your preparedness, and, and what you can do to help the search and rescue volunteers in your region of the province or wherever you're listening from, maybe you're across the country, uh, we'd love to know. You can always pop that into the question and, and, and use the question field. So obviously you're on mute and uh, your cameras are off, but you can see us and, and as we get going, um, you'll have a chance definitely to ask some questions of our special guest of me, but really it's about uh, Christine, Jarrett and VJ tonight, um, our special guests. So without further ado, uh, I'll do some introductions and, and we'll get rolling. Uh, by the way, the Adventure Smart program has been around for 17 years. It is a program underneath the BC Search and Rescue Association. And uh, it's been a very busy 17 years of outdoor education through trailhead outreach, online now, traditional media, social media. So lots of engagement. But the whole focus of what we do is to increase your awareness so that we can help reduce the number and severity of search and rescue calls in the province of BC. Uh, we have about 1,700 calls every year in BC for search and rescue. Last year, there were over 2,000. And, and we're an active, healthy province. There's no question about it. And we have easy access to incredible terrain. At times, that easy access, for some who are unaware, it can get a false sense of security. And we don't want you to be fooled by that false sense of security. So you're going to gain some different perspectives from our special guests tonight. Um, I'd like to introduce Christine. Christine would spend every waking moment um, hiking, trail running, paddle boarding, or rock climbing if she could, ever since her first real hike um, to Machu Picchu in 2006. Chris Christine has been obsessed with hiking, most of all. That's been her priority for outdoor recreation. Um, as an environment cons conservationist by profession, she's always looking for new ways to help others develop and connect with the wondrous outdoors um, she manages a Vancouver-based wildlife uh, education nonprofit called Northwest Wildlife Preservation Society by day. And in her free time, she shows her love for the great outdoors through her passion project, Hikes Near Vancouver. Without further ado, I'd like you to introduce you to Christine. And she's here to share her, her perspectives on being a, an advocate for outdoor safety. She shares incredible information on social media. And she always includes and inserts safety messaging and resources and where people can learn more. So welcome, Christine. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me um, or know me as Hikes Near Vancouver, I'm a real person too. My name is Christine uh, Kronitsky, as Sandra introduced. Um, contrary to popular belief, I don't actually hike as a full-time job as much as I wish I could. Um, I do work full-time uh, managing a wildlife conservation charity, and that sort of feeds into why I started um, this project, Hikes Near Vancouver, because one of my biggest passions is environment conservation, and um, something that we promote at my charity, and I promote just as an individual because I care about it so much. Um, is like the connection really, um, how conservation of wild spaces takes place. And to me, I think that that happens when we have access to something and we know about it, we start to feel personally connected to it. And naturally we want to protect the things that we love. So that's sort of how this all got started. Um, I'm just obsessed with hiking really. Um, and so that's, 
you know, I just naturally wanted to start sharing about my my activities and uh, some friends that I make it public because maybe some people would be interested in hearing what I had to say. Um, Vancouver being a super outdoorsy, active city, I didn't really think there was a need for my account, but um, you know, we have so many great resources like Vancouver Trails and Outdoor Vancouver and, you know, so many different um, amazing websites where people can learn about trails. So I wasn't really sure um, if there was going to be a need for something like my account, but um, I was really surprised that um, it grew so quickly. I had, you know, thousands of followers within a couple of weeks, I think. It was it was pretty nuts. Um, and over the couple of years that I've been doing this now, I've started to realize that it's not necessarily the information um, about the hikes per se, the the stats and things like that that I share. It's more about the personal experiences, the the fact that you know I'm not an expert anything like you know the people that you're going to hear from after me who are you know like supreme experts in their field. I'm just a regular person who just loves to hang out outdoors, um, and I think that my stories resonate with a lot of people like you who joined here today, um, and so. When I share experiences about the things that I've been doing, people sort of get it, right? They're going through the same thing. Um, and so I feel like that's created this incredible opportunity for me to engage with people and have that influence. You know, I, I used to think that being an influencer was such a like tacky, yucky word that I, I hated being associated with. Um, but then when I start really thinking about it, um, when I have these um, interests in sharing important topics like environment conservation and safety, um, it's just such a great opportunity to influence the way that people think about situations. Um, and when it comes to things like hiking, safety is so important and it's something that a lot of people don't really like to think about. I don't know if it's like the negative aspect or they don't like thinking about you know, worst case scenarios, or they just think it won't happen to them or whatever the situation. Um, I've created this really great opportunity where people are following me for looking at my pretty pictures and finding out all the, you know, like fun adventures that I'm getting up to. But while I have their attention, um, I get to share with them information that's really important, like how to stay safe while doing these really fun activities. So um, that's really about me. Um, and sort of feeds into what this presentation for me is about. Um, it's about why I think sharing experiences are like is really, really important. So if there's one message that I could ask you all to take away from my presentation today, it's that we all have the ability to impact others around us. And social media is one of those um, really great tools that can be um, detrimental to people's safety but it can also really help so there's you know a lot of chatter that goes on about you know like yeah, social media having a bad rap especially when it comes to things like hiking you know people posting photos of these gorgeous places without the um, important information that goes along with it you know like all the different ways that you need to be prepared and um, you know things like that so I think that it's up to all of us. We have an obligation, but we also have an opportunity to shift that perception of what social media in relation to hiking is. Um, and instead of being this negative thing where people associate, you know, posting a, a picture of, you know, Joffrey Lakes or Water Sprite Lake and talking about all the dangers that that brings, instead we can change that through our own activities and our own awareness of, of how social media works and influencing works to shift that perception so that people more respect and understand and appreciate the value that social media can bring. Um, you know, I have something like 15,000 people that see my stories and my posts. Like that's like, to me, that blows my mind. Um, 15,000 people, like, of course, not everybody looks at that. But if I have the ability to, you know, tell somebody who wouldn't necessarily have brought the essentials with them on a hike, you know, but they're looking up 
you know, how to get to Joffrey Lakes or something. And then in my post about Joffrey Lakes, I can say, you know, before you go, make sure you bring the essentials with you. These are the things, um, you know, help prevent, a, you know, potential mishap or whatever the case is. If somebody reads that and changes their behavior, like it's created a difference. It's made a really significant impact. Um, and so the thing about me that resonates a lot is that I, I'm not really that shy, I don't think. Um, I, I'm not someone who, you know, like, I mean, of course, every once in a while, I'll just post a pretty picture and I'm like, hey, here I am in this gorgeous spot. But a lot of the time I post, you know, about the mistakes that I make as a hiker, as a human, like to, to make mistakes is totally human and you don't have to be a beginner to make mistakes. You can be a super experienced hiker. You can be an expert in whatever sport it is that you're doing and you can still make mistakes. Um, and those specifically are the things that people connect with most. So not only do is that what I focus on, but it's a message that I sort of am asking you as viewers, of, as people who are going out there and hiking, um, especially the beginner hikers who are going to be making the most mistakes, but advanced hikers as well, who we do all make mistakes and some people don't like to admit them for whatever reason, but I implore you to share information about the mistakes that you're making because that's how other people will learn. Um, and those are the stories that really resonate with people that will make them take note of what you're saying um, and potentially adapt their behavior. And you have the opportunity with your social media when you share these stories that the people watching them, your friends and family are those people who trust you, who who like you, who respect your opinions. And so when you share experiences, like things like, you know, oh, you forgot to bring your headlamp on that hike and, you know, sunset hit and suddenly it was dark and whatever, however the situation is that you got out of it, you know, if you share that message, then the potential for that friend of yours who looks and is going on a hike tomorrow is like, oh, better make sure that my headlamp is charged or whatever, so that doesn't happen. So. Social media has such an enormous um, possibility of helping so many people. So I just, I think that it's something that we all really need to pay attention to in the way that we um, use it ourselves um, and the way that we read it. So the some experiences that I wanna talk about where I've made mistakes are um, a good example that I like to talk about is Water Sprite Lake. So um, a couple summers ago, I hiked to Water Sprite Lake, like a lot of people do. It's a super popular hike in Squamish. I'm sure you've all heard about it. <laughs> um, I've hiked there a bunch of times, but uh, this particular time was my very first time. And it was summer and I think it was like July or August or something. It was insane, like 33 degrees or something insane. Um, and I hiked up there to camp for the night and like most, advanced hikers we you know get there and you're like oh let's like you know um like scramble up to this other little thing that's farther away from what the the destination of the hike is um and so you know we all set our bags down and we're like let's just go scramble up there and check out what the lake looks like uh from from above um and it was really stupid and it was the first and last time I've, I'll ever do this but you know I just I had my um you know the super lightweight like Birkenstocks that I carry with me for around the campsite because you know nobody wants to wear hiking boots around all the time um I was just wearing those I had all my stuff left in my tent didn't bring anything with me except for my phone I was like it's 30 minutes like just up above um, up on this like shaley slope that was pretty steep it looks pretty close but it was actually quite far um, and, uh, yeah, it was really stupid. Um, and I slipped a million times, obviously I'm wearing sandals on a shale slope. I cut my toe open. Luckily I'm a responsible hiker. I had a first aid kit back in my tent. So I, you know, bandaged myself back up, but it's a mistake that happens all the time. Um, I see it all the time with my friends, even now, like, you know, every single time pretty much we hike and we go somewhere and you're near the summit, everyone's like, let's drop our packs and, you know, bag this peak and then we'll come back. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And, and I did that. I do that. I, I used to do that. And so now 
I share this story with people all the time because even my, you know, advanced hiker friends think like, oh, it's not a big deal. And I'm like, yes, it is. Like what happens? Like what happens if, you know, like it's the end of the day, you're typically the most tired, you're, you know, not thinking straight. You're usually like hungry, the, you know, like there's just when you're scrambling, there's inherent risk with that um, over just a straightforward trail. So basically there's a, there's a million reasons why you don't do that. But uh, the point is that so many people you know, beginner or advanced think that, um, you know, your skill level um, sort of sets you apart from, you know, not needing to be extra cautious, which is totally wrong. Um, and so instead of me being like, oh, I'm embarrassed, this thing happened to me, I have this public profile, like, I find it really important for me to share these stories. And I hope that you do too. Um, so that's really my main point with that. Um, you know, we all make mistakes. I every single year get super sunburnt. I don't know if you can tell, but like last weekend or two weekends ago, I went out in the snow hiking and obviously the snow is super reflective and I got really badly burnt. And it's not the first time that's happened, even though sun protections, you know, on the list of essentials, like I never put enough on and I just got super duper burnt. And um, sun protection is something that's, you know, a really, really important thing that people overlook really easily. So um, basically, I just want you to be able to see my pictures and other people's pictures on Instagram and other social media ch um, channels, you know, seeing the videos, understanding all the things that are behind those photos, you know, like, I wish that the caption limit was, you know, unlimited, and we could just put all the information that I possibly could, that anyone would need to know, but it's just not possible. I mean, technically, it's not possible, the captions are actually limited. But, you know, like on the left there, I'm scrambling up in the Downton Creek area in Pemberton. And on the right there, I'm, I'm hiking up um, Ronning in, in Pemberton as well. Apparently, it's my favorite area. But like that, that picture on the right, Ronning, like what you don't see there is like, I can't fit all of that in the caption. Like, I can't tell you that, you know, you have like, I have avalanche gear with me. I've taken an avalanche safety course. I have a ice axe in my backpack. Um, I am wearing snowshoes that you can't see. I've been hiking for, you know, 20 years. I um, am with someone who also has the gear and who's responsible. I've left a trip plan with my friends. I, you know, like all these things that like you can't see in that photo and I just don't have the space to tell you about. So, you know, every once in a while, even though, I consider myself a pretty responsible social social media poster. Um, I can't put all of the pertinent information into every single post that you need to know. So you as a social media viewer, you can't look at a photo and say, well, she went there, so I'm going to go there. Like it's, it doesn't work like that. Like there's obviously so much more behind. There's so much more to the story uh, behind each photograph. Um, that really at the end of the day it's your responsibility to know and to understand that social media can be an amazing resource but it's one of very 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 many resources you know i i use social media too i check snow levels i check information but i also consult lots of other um sources to make sure that i know exactly what's going on i make sure that i'm capable of doing this that i um, can mitigate whatever risks I possibly can. Um, so there's just, there's so much information uh, behind the stories like that. So um, really that's that's the most that I, I wanna tell you. Just basically do your research um, and understand that social media can be amazing. And so let's all contribute to that by being better with our own social media. Um, but just understanding that there's much more than what you see on the surface. Thank you, Christine. That was awesome. I was making notes, even though, you know, I check your posts out all the time, too, personally and work wise. And, and we've shared a few. So we're really grateful that you've been able to support us that way. And, and it is what goes on behind the scenes that that we can't all talk about. We try to as much as we can here at BC Adventure Smart. We try to go into that finer detail. But I love the focus that you played on that responsibility of the hiker who shares, which so many of us do, if it's a summit or a paddle or a uh, overnight camp we love to share but there is more to it and there's so much behind the scenes so thanks for going into that um i had a question before hopefully some of the audience does you're welcome to throw your questions in the in the question field um for those of you who are watching but it, you know i know you go out with others and i do too can you can you share a little bit about, about group dynamics and how that's worked either really positively 
for you, or maybe not so much, because I know sometimes it depends on uh, experiences in the group, um, fitness, did they have breakfast, uh, did they have the skills, like how does group dynamics, how has it worked for you? Yeah, um, that is definitely a really tough thing that um, gets refined over the years, um, you know, with people's uh, interests and things like that shifting too. Usually I try to keep a core group of people that um, where we know each other really well and our skill levels are, you know, at least quasi on par. Um, but I, every once in a while, and of course, like pre pandemic, I used to hike a lot with um, strangers, you know, like a part of my platform for, with Hikes Near Vancouver is um, a hiking group. And there's, you know, like 10,000 members or something like that, where people just connect with strangers. And that's much more difficult. That's much more, yeah. Uh, has inherent risk, I, I think. Um, but the thing that I think is most important to take away from uh, hiking and group dynamics is that you have to, if you're going to be hiking with other people, you have to be understanding that the, the weakest link of your group is the most important and they have to be supported. Um, I've seen and heard so many awful stories about, you know, people like being uh, not quite capable for for what they've taken on and that person gets left behind or something like that and that's just like that's not cool like it's not it's not safe it's also just not a good person thing to do um and so i think that when you're going to hike in a group the most important thing is understanding that you are in a group you're not there by yourself with other people and so you each have to take care of each other as much as you're responsible for yourself it's the right thing to do to take care of each other it is, and, and no matter the size of that group, right? We, we get asked a lot about solo adventures. We, we Almost every week when we do a, a webinar, which we do every Thursday night, people ask about, so what would you suggest we do? And we I like to hike alone. I like to paddle alone. We always encourage the best practices not to be alone. Uh, and so those group dynamics come into play for us before you even hit the trail, right? Or before you hit your kayak or your paddleboard, whatever your, your choice is. Um, you mentioned a little bit about essentials and then um, hopefully we've got some questions from the audience and if not we'll move on to Jarrett and then maybe some people will start to listen up and ask a few questions but you listed some essentials some season and sport specific essentials you had your avi gear in your pack and you talked about your training what additional pieces do you bring let's say for summer hiking because we know we all have the list that is kind of our foundation and we always talk about adding seasonal and sport specific and, and I always encourage people to think about their personal essentials if it's medication uh, favorite chocolate, whatever, whatever your thing is that gets you through that. Do you have anything yeah. that's that's essential for you that you that you bring? Yeah. Um. So water for me, I'm just always naturally dehydrated, but especially in the summertime, it's the biggest concern that I find typically with me and everybody else. Like a lot of the people, I'm sure search and rescue will attest. Like the people on the trails who have issues are like having cramps because they're dehydrated. Um. And so not only is it you know to bring sufficient water but for me i always bring like i have one of those cats dine um like squeezy water bottles with a filter in it so if there is any water source i can you know filter it easily i always in my first aid kit have um tablets and drops as well which i hate using but um they're you know in case of an emergency i have tons of like different electrolyte things um you know i have like salt packets electrolytes i have um what else like um uh what's it called cordyceps like like different like energy drinks and and things that are um that help with with hydration essentially and energy because i find that that's like the biggest the biggest issue with people um and so that's my biggest thing and something i try to push a lot too is people think like oh to bring all this stuff is going to take you know take up so much space and weight and it doesn't you know like my bag's always really small but i have a million different things um it's just you know these like tiny itty bitty like salt packets or whatever um and medication first aid kits that you buy from the from mac or wherever like total garbage like they're just they're not they, they're like the absolute base like what you need but you need to put so much stuff in there you know like band like more band-aids you need more you know um uh, what are those things called like tensor bandages you know like big pieces of gauze like lots of medication like i put lots of allergy pills for you know if myself or other people have allergic reactions to things um you know like there's just there's so much like i've i 
pretty much have used my gear for other people like a billion times over compared to how much I've used it for myself. And that's something to consider too, is that like when you're out there, you need to like help other people sometimes, especially if you're in remote locations and there's nobody else to, to help those other people. You know, like I can't tell you the amount of time I've like bandaged up people or give them electrolytes or whatever, giving them an extra headlamp or something to keep warm, you know, like it's, uh, yeah, it's it's really important to 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 know what you need and what you would need in the case of like the worst case scenario. Make sure you have it. Like in winter, I always have those grabber warmer things because I get so cold and there's no way. You know, I have like a bivy and a million blankets and like you know snap heaters and like my debt boil and like a million different fire starters and you know and still they only you know take up this much space. But uh, <laughs> yeah being prepared is is it, super important awesome thank it you is. So and, and as oh, oh sorry Sandra. yeah we have a few questions from our audience uh selvena is asking a great question how much water do you calculate to bring for the day one liter per two hours or something it totally depends on for me anyway for uh, it depends on uh, the season and then uh how long you're going to be out of course so Research, researching trips, I think, is the most important for this because you can, you know, if you look at a topographical map, you can see where there's like streams and rivers and things like that, where there's possibilities of filling up water if you're going to be hiking in snowy areas. Like, I'm the same. I'm just like you. Like, I don't want to carry extra weight that I don't have to, especially when I'm doing a super hard hike. Um, so, you know, my tr my typical is I'll bring three liters of water, um, two to three liters of water. Um, and then I also have like the flavored things that I can add to the gross water that I pick up in whatever random like pond I will stumble upon if I need it. Um, and I just make sure that I always have that water filter for additional water and making sure that I know where water sources are. So, you know, being able to, to see um, accurate maps. So even if it's not on your trail, if you have to like hike out for, you know, a kilometer to get to that lake or whatever, if there's no running water, of course, um, moving water of course but uh yeah i usually say like for a half day like no matter what i'm doing I'll, I'll only bring max three liters of water um but i have ways of getting more water is basically the thing like if i'm going out for just a two hour short little thing i'll bring you know a liter or two i don't have a prescribed thing i, I have um two different um water reservoir like one is a liter and a half and for like trail running and stuff and then another one's uh, three liters and then i'll bring like an extra nalgene or something so it just depends but the more the better of course but i think the take home is just making sure that you know where to get more water um and ways of filtering it awesome thanks for that answer and we have another great question here from stephanie uh stephanie's asking could you reiterate what percentage your uh percentage weight your pack should be relatively to your body weight and she says also two of my items that I've had to use that are not on the essentials list are uh, feminine hygiene pans for head wounds and other big bleeds and hot shots for when people go into shock even in the summer so good tips there um, and Joanne also added you know where bring spare contacts or glasses uh, if, you, if you wear them as well um, just in case you you know something happens to them so yeah but just about the pack weight yeah so again i'm not an expert or anything this is just my own personal experience but um if i'm going on a day hike my pack is no matter what if it's like two hours or 10 hours i pretty much have the same thing except for you know some additional um food but um my pack's usually around 15 pounds i would say give or take um if i'm doing an overnight trip like the longest overnight trip i've taken was um uh, what's that called the sunshine coast trail i did it for like eight days um nine days eight days and my even then my overnight pack was only 40 pounds so it's just about preparing and i mean obviously i hike a lot and have done it for many years so i've i've been blessed with the opportunity to be able to get like super lightweight gear um and knowing how to to pack smartly but i think it's just it's a matter of personal preference right like trial and error um so you know packing packing the lightest weight gear possible, but making sure that you have everything that you need. It doesn't really matter what the weight is, I would say. Um, 
So, but like I personally, I hate carrying lots of weight too. So all my backpacks are like ultra lightweight backpacks. And then I have all ultra lightweight gear uh, to the greatest extent possible. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much, Christine. Uh, that wraps up all the questions uh, for this round. Um, if anybody has any more questions, feel free to send them over to info at adventuresmartbc.ca and we will happily uh, follow up when Christine has time and get you back an answer. Um, again, thank you so much, Christine, for your time and I'll let Sandra introduce our next presenter. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Christine. That was awesome. Um, and enjoy the rest of your evening. We really appreciate your time. I was just checking out Christine's Instagram before I came back on. She has an excellent post right now about navigation. So that's so exciting that she she puts up these incredible pictures and then she goes into that finer detail. So she is definitely adventure smart to us and, and really showcases what we can all do, I think, as we go out there and share some more. Thanks again, Christine. And nice post, by the way. I'll just about to, to put a little like on that one. As we move on to our second guest, we're, I wanted to share um, some information um, about Jarrett. Jarrett is um, with Talon Helicopters. And for over the past 14 years, Jarrett's career has taken him on quite an amazing journey, to say the least, from flying over narwhal and icebergs in the Arctic in 2012, to spending weeks straight in thick smoke, working with the wildfire um, departments in BC's largest ever recorded wildfire in 2017. He began working for Talon uh, and if you live on the North Shore anywhere, you, you may see Jarrett way up there. Uh, and so he started working for Talon in 2013 and now holds the position of chief pilot. And at Talon, they conduct a wide variety of services from firefighting to tourism. And, and Jarrett's mentioned his most favorite field of work is the work he does with search and rescue. Uh, welcome, Jarrett, and it's good to have you aboard. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so my <clears throat> excuse me my kind of topic i would like to cover today is giving you my perspective of being out on search and rescue on the calls that don't go so quick and easy um you'll see on the news quite often or on social media helicopter came in and hoisted out the injured party and they save the day kind of thing, uh, which does happen frequently, but we also have calls where it doesn't go quick and easy. Um, so Christine gave you a lot more of the preparation side, and then I'll dive into kind of something has gone wrong. You have called for help. Um, yes, quite often it will be a helicopter in the terrain around uh, the North Shore Mountains or, or the Sea to Sky area. Um, we don't have road access up to the top of many of the mountains, so helicopters are the go-to choice. Um, it's quicker, it's faster, um, but we cannot always get there. Um, so a few photos here. On the left, that is trying to fly up Lynn Valley on the North Shore. I'm maybe a quarter mile past the last row of houses and it's just a white wall of cloud. You can see the trees just disappearing into the cloud. I can't remember that exact call, but that was with North Shore Rescue and there was someone missing up, last known Upland Valley. Um, we're not like a big airline. Um, the airline planes, they fly on these fixed highways in the sky. They can fly in the clouds because they're on this set path to and from one airport to the next. There is no magical, highway in the air when you're that close to the hills up in the mountains so if the clouds are in our way we cannot go we need to be able to see the ground we need to be able to see the trees we need to be able to see power lines um, gondolas all that sort of stuff um, so kind of my key there is you know you do call for help when you need help of, of course you should but uh, don't always expect the helicopter to show up five minutes later and we do have difficulties sometimes you will be waiting for the ground team to make it in and whether it be a more serious injury a stretcher carry out of the woods can happen and it does happen and um, it takes a long time so part of the essentials is pack enough equipment be prepared um, be prepared for the long haul sometimes uh, we're not in and out in a hurry Another one there, um, this was from last summer, that photo on the right, that's smoke from wildfires. Um, 
I'm trying to take a guess here, but I think I'm roughly over top of the Lions looking east, and that would be like Crown Mountain, Seymour Mountains, um, Judge Howie in that way in the background. Um, <clears throat> so sometimes we can't go up to the top of the mountains because of clouds. Sometimes the top's nice and clear and we can't get down to the valley bottom because of things like uh, valley smoke or valley fog. Again, we're stuck due to weather. Um, that could be fog, smoke, icing conditions. Um, any of that sort of stuff is what's making our day a little bit more difficult and slowing down the rescues. Um, we could jump over to the next slide if you don't mind. Here we go. Um, so here's a takeaway. When, when we're out searching for people, I would say these days we do more rescues then we do search and rescues um, with cell service uh, spot devices um, we're quite often very aware of where the injured parties or lost parties are we have a pretty good idea based on coordinates or descriptions if you have cell service um, so quite often it's more of a rescue but we do need to find you even if we have a, a coordinate it's going to get us to the general area and then, uh, for example, that photo on the left of the snowy hillside, that was two winters ago, Port Alberni. We flew across the strait to go help them out. Um, a paraglider had crashed into the side of the hill, and he's in the middle of that photo, hiding behind a white parachute in white snow. Um, we had coordinates. We were told where he was because the local helicopter had already found him we came over with the uh, longline team to extract him off the hill that other helicopter had left so we just had coordinates uh, which gets us very close to the correct spot but it took us a long time to find him. just hiding behind a white parachute in the white snow didn't stand up and wave didn't uh, you know strip off his coat because he was wearing a brighter shirt underneath the dark coat um, yeah, it's shocking how many times the helicopter is hovering 50 feet away from the coordinate and we can't find the people we're looking for because they're scared of the helicopter noise and they hide under a tree or just sit still expecting that we're staring right at them. Um, so some some great things we can do. We were out last week up near Brunswick Mountain, uh, Mount Brunswick, Lions Bay flew in for an injured party and one of the bystanders there had a bright red shirt on. He took his shirt off and waved it like a flag and we saw him from a mile away on our way in. So bingo, right away, we found him. That is what we like to see. Um, another one, we're now approved for night search and rescue. So when we're flying at night, we're using night vision goggles. Um, there's a video here if we can get the video to go. This is a training demonstration, and it's showing how effective a small little headlamp is. Half the people in the video have headlamps. Half the people in the video are you literally just uh, turning on the cell phone flashlight. Um, but uh, can we get the video? Here we go. helicopter noise I think my audio is back uh, so the flashing lights there um, cell phone lights and headlamps like a hiking headlamp they are bright at night um, they work well during the day if you're in the trees but honestly if we do come down to looking for you at night just turn your light on whatever light you have um, we will see it from miles away, whereas if you sit there with your light off, it's gonna take us quite a while to find you. Uh, that's Dog Mountain, uh, Mount Seymour, and you could you could see the ski hill lights in the background of that video as well. Um, not on the still shot there, but uh, when the video, I don't know if you, if, if you notice the big, big bright lights in the background, that was the ski hill, and that wasn't hikers. It was on the foreground on that snowy ledge there was the hikers. So again, like 
hey, if, if you've called 911 or a friend has called for help and you're there with them, um, if, if you hear a helicopter nearby, just start doing whatever you can. Shake the trees if you're in deep canopy. You can wave your jacket. You can turn on your light. Don't expect we see you until you know for sure that we actually see you. And you know, like you'll you'll see us. The uh, the rescue crews they'll open a window or open a door and give you a big wave and let you know we see you and and all that sort of stuff. Um, one more there. Here we go. Um, here's a key takeaway from uh, from dealing with calls over the years. If you think you're in trouble, if it's come down to it, call 911. Um, how many hikers have gone out hiking? They try to make one phone call to their friend to say, hey, I think I'm lost, but I'm not sure, but I have 3% battery left. And then five hours later, 911 gets a phone call from that friend and says, uh, my friend was hiking. He said he might have been lost, but I don't know where he was. Um, so if you are in trouble, Phone 911, there's multiple reasons why. Um, the dispatchers will take as much information, they're trained on how to do that. Um, it's not as commonly known as I wish it was, but if you phone 911, it doesn't matter if you're with TELUS, Rogers, FIDO, um, the 911 system's gonna hunt for any cell tower out there. So even if your phone says it does not have service, you can try 911. And if it's hitting a tower that doesn't belong to your network, it'll get through. That is not going to happen when you phone your friends um, or or anyone else. Don't phone Talon Helicopters. Don't phone Squamish Search and Rescue or North Shore Rescue. Phone 911. They make the right call on launching helicopters, boats, ground crews. Um, they call for extra resources from out of town if extra resources are required. Um, and and then they have the the ability to pull coordinates off of your phone if there's a half decent signal as well, and um, and that's a huge benefit to us as well. Like, like I said, most of our calls these days are rescues. Um, the actual search, the multi-day search, still happens. It's not as common, but those are the calls we dread. When you're just needled in a haystack, you're looking for someone in behind Crown Mountain, but you're back your head, you're kind of thinking they might be a whole valley over. I have no idea, but they told their friends that they wanted to try Crown Mountain this weekend, and that's the only info we have. Um, so, yeah, if we can get a coordinate off a cell phone through the uh, emergency dispatch system, huge help we you know like it, it's my job to help people i do do other flights as well search and rescue flying is a big portion of it uh, we want to help people we don't want to go do the needle in the haystack search we very much will do that um, but we'd rather come help you take you home to your family and then i can come home to my family as well um that about wraps up what i've got to say Excellent, Jarrett. Thank you so much for your time. We have some excellent questions coming in um, from our audience members. Um, sure. Kelsey is wondering how effective glow sticks are at helping you guys locate people. Um, glow sticks are good. Lights are better. Um, yeah, there, there's when when we're there's a long answer here, but I'll keep it short. We, we fly with night vision goggles at night. That's when a glow stick would be effective. The glow stick's not doing anything during the day. So at night, if we are in your general area and you had glow sticks and you didn't have a flashlight, glow sticks are great. Flashlights are better. The glow stick we're probably going to see with direct visual like if we're if, if we're looking right at it whereas a flashlight if you're underneath the trees the light kind of bounces off the different branches and leaves and makes its way up through the canopies a lot easier um, so glow sticks are good we do use them as a SAR tool um, we can lay out glow sticks and it helps kind of mark landing areas if it's a spot we're going back and forth to multiple times we can land at night in the middle of nowhere but if we're going back to the same spot to move crews five times we can chuck glow sticks and it lightens it up a bit 
Um, so yeah, they do work. Uh, lights are better. And, and uh, if you have the ability to make a small fire, uh, like a tiny, tiny little fire, just big enough to roast a marshmallow, we're going to see that from quite a distance away if it were, uh, if it were dark out. Excellent. Uh, this is another question from Nicholas, and he says, Hi, Jarrett. What do you think of using laser pointers to get the helicopter's attention? I am aware that it can blind the pilots. However, it seems like a sure way to get attention. Would love to hear your experts' take on it. Cheers. Uh, again, use a light. If you shine a light, we're going to see a light. Um, laser pointers aren't going to do anything during the day, so again, we're falling back to night. If you shine a light at night when we're flying on night vision goggles, we will see you. You glow like a Christmas tree. Um, I have been hit by green lasers while flying over the city at night and uh, people who, I won't use any specific words, but people who shine lights at helicopters and planes because they're mad at the noise that the helicopter is making over their city. It's scary. Um, I've never gotten a laser beam in my eye directly, but it lit up the cabin of the helicopter and I kind of turn my head the other way, turn the helicopter. We train for it. We train how to fly away from lasers without physically looking at them. So I would say even if you're in the woods and you want to get my attention, use a flashlight. If the laser is the only thing you have, turn it on and point it at the ground or point it at a tree. Do not point it up at the helicopter. That's a, a firm no. Excellent. And one more about lights. Are flashing lights better um, than just a stationary light? And this question is from Lorraine. Uh, flashing lights are great. The other thing you can do is, I don't know, here's, hold on. Here's your light. Just pop your hand back and forth. If you have a solid light, that is also awesome. Um, what we have found when we're flying on night vision goggles is those little reflective markers that mark the trails the whole way. We see those glowing on goggles, but they're a very still light. They don't change. They don't flicker. They're solid. So the flashing really gets our attention. Or if you pulse your hand back and forth across a solid light, if you don't have a flashing option, then it really gets our attention as something out of the ordinary. So flashing is good. Great. Um, and just actually, someone else has just tacked on one more thing about lights. Um, some headlights have a red SOS light. In trouble, does white or red give a stronger signal to the helicopter? Uh, color doesn't matter. White is typically brighter. If you're going to look up the lumens, like the brightness of that light, usually the whites are the brightest. Um, Color doesn't matter. What does affect us is LED lights. Certain LED lights are a wavelength of light that the goggles don't see. Um, so LED lights, again, we're trained on how to find them and avoid them. So, so things like, uh, I'm getting distracted here, but things like uh, cell phone towers and that, they have lights on them. It's mandatory, they have to be marked with lights. Some of those lights are LEDs. You can see them with your naked eye and with the night vision goggles, you cannot see them at all. So we scan, we look through the goggles, then we turn our head and we kind of look around the goggles and then we look through the goggles, then we look around them. Um, if I'm being picky, LED lights are not as good as your standard, more traditional bulb, but we can find either or because like I said, we search with our naked eye and we search through the goggles as well. Um, color, we've, we've seen both and, and I, I don't have a preference over color, just bright is good. Excellent. Um, so we have two questions regarding RECO. So Chris is asking um, if NSR has access to RECO. They definitely do. Chris, yep. they have a big, um, huge unit that they will mount on the front of the helicopter and fly over and send out that signal. Um, so Terry is saying, how about the RECO backpack tag? How are they to assist in your finding the location of a subject in the day or the night? Uh, RECO's great. We have a helicopter detector, a helicopter RECO detector. I believe, well, we were the first in Canada, the second in North America to receive it, but they're slowly shipping out more and more. If there's not three in the province, I think a third one is on its way. Um, you know, we're based in Vancouver. The RECO is based in North Vancouver. We can use it mutual aid 
anywhere in the province if we needed to, just the further away, the longer it takes. Uh, the recos are awesome. The only downfall to the reco is if you don't have a reflector, it's not going to do much. But um, if you had a reflector, and if you had that in your trip plan, like it's an immediate launch of the reco if you were missing, uh, because that's how effective it is. We hang the reco under the helicopter. We can hang it on the hoist or the long line. We can fly it day. We can fly it at night. And we can search. If you've got a reflector, we can now search for you at 60 miles an hour and cover a lot of terrain. Whereas if you don't have a reco, we kind of go low and slow, crawling along, looking for you. Um, the the reco, essentially, you just fly along the hillside in a grid in the general area where you think the lost person is. If we fly over you, you get a signal and a boop, 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 and then it goes silent. Um, we've used it on multiple calls. We've had a few successes with it. We have never yet had a trip plan. Like we've, we've never had a missing person with a trip plan that says, I have a reco. That would be the ideal scenario. What we're doing is we're launching on missing, missing persons not knowing whether they had reco reflectors or not and when we get to kind of plan a plan b plan c usually around plan b it's let's give the reco a try if we have a general area if they have a reflector we will find them um, different from the handheld reco the handheld reco is much more fine tuning finding someone in a smaller area but the heli detector has been great so far the trick is getting reflectors. Um, they don't take batteries, they don't run out of power, they're not, uh, you can get a standalone reflector and just stuff it in your pocket. And a lot of gear these days is coming with recos, so I would very much recommend them. Um, again, I, I'll backpedal there a bit. They don't replace your avalanche beacons, um, but they are a summer and winter tool that I would put in your essentials kit, a reco reflector. Um, they were originally designed for avalanche purposes, but uh, they're now in mountain bike helmets. They're in uh, kayaking gear. If you're lost, we can find you with the heli detector. Yeah, uh, Reco's great. I just actually upgraded my day hiking pack from MEC, and MEC branded packs have a Reco reflector in them. Um, I got a nice purple and green pack, so it's nice and bright, so I can be seen uh, from the sky, so I'm not blending into the forest. Um, I have another excellent question here from Randy. Is there anything specific a party can do to prepare the area when you come into hoist or longline? Um, usually we're hoisting or longlining because the terrain isn't good enough for landing. Um, but what you can do to be helpful is, you know, quite often if you've had an injured friend, you'll take your jacket and lay it over them or maybe a blanket or if it was your campsite, your tents might still be up. Um, the helicopter downwash causes a lot of things to fly around. If you could clean up the site, pick up loose clothing, pick up loose tents. Um, if you had cell service and you were talking to the rescue team, which happens a lot these days, um, you know, you're on the phone to them, hey, we're on the south peak of first pump on Seymour and my friend's broken leg, we need help. Um, you know, a quick little description that there's there's a nasty snag that's just uphill from us that looks like it could fall over any minute. If you want to give that description, that's just bonus information for us. We we do our reconnaissance anyways to try to find all that. Um, that's why, uh, you know, when we show up overhead, we're not throwing people down the hoist immediately. We take a couple minutes to recce the site to, to find the, the hazards, our flight paths, etc. cetera. Um, but if you throw that bonus information at the SAR team, no one's ever going to get mad at you for sharing that extra bit. Um, but in general, um, just, just loose items is, would be my biggest uh, point there. Clean up the loose gear, blankets, uh, those, uh, what do you call them, the, the tinfoil space blankets, those things fly in the wind like crazy. Chuck them in a backpack or put some rocks on them, something like that. 
Great, thank you so much. Um, so I've got one more uh, question from Kelsey, and I think you went into this already in your presentation. Um, she's wondering how PLBs work and are they worth it? And I, I can say they are. Um, having a PLB helps the helicopter pilots immensely because it gives them a, a location and it gives the SAR teams a location of, of where you are um, pretty quickly. Uh, so I'll let Jarrett go into that a little bit more. Um, and then I believe that will be our last question for the evening. Sure, yeah, um, like a spot beacon, that's kind of the idea we're yeah, going for here. Yeah, I believe PL, yeah. personal locator beacon, so spot, Garmin, mm -hmm. InReach, Zolio, all of those, all different, you know, methods of getting it out. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a kind of a pro and a con quickly here, I'll try, but um, the one of the great things about a spot is you press the SOS button, it will wait until it has a good satellite signal and a solid coordinate before sending out that distress call. That might take 10 seconds, that might take two minutes, but it'll wait just a couple of minutes to make sure it has a valid source of its location before it sends that information out. So um, that's great. When we get a spot beacon, no, it's not going to put you two feet away from that point every time, but it always tends to get us in the correct general area. And if you press SOS, um, you know, help's going to get launched right away. So it, it doesn't matter if it's uh, you're lost or your friend's hurt or you're hurt, uh, they'll just start sending help. Um, one issue we did have with someone who wanted to be found was he would turn on his spot, press send, turn it off to save batteries. And then an hour later, turn it on, press send, turn it off. Um, it's kind of like the emergency beacon in the aircraft. Once you activate them, leave the thing on because it sits there and acquires the best signal it can before it sends. It doesn't send the moment you touch that SOS button. Um, so if you turn it on, press send, turn it off, it's not going to send anything. Just they're great. We really like getting a coordinate from them. Um, the fancier ones now you can text information with, uh, which is even better. But um, yeah, I, I would say that's money well spent on a personal beacon. Absolutely. I don't let my dad go out in the woods without him because uh, he, he does multi-day trips by himself. But uh, big trip plan, the uh, the spot sends us a friendly message every now and again. He's got the text friendly one and works great. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jarrett, again, for your time and your expertise this evening. Um, we really appreciate you joining us again and uh, Sandra should be here shortly. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, Jarrett, that was great. That was really, uh, really interesting. And it's nice to hear it from you. I know we share a lot of versions of that in our in our survive outside program uh, that we deliver quite quite a bit, but it's nice to hear it from you and your perspective. Obviously, um, it, it makes it makes a difference. It's really it's really good. Um, I will ask you a quick question, and hopefully it's a one word answer, and then we'll move on to our third guest. What's the best color for you to see out there? I'm colorblind and I see colors, but I'm curious for you, what's the one that stands out the most? You know, we talk about all sorts, but what works best? I think I'd be in trouble if I didn't say yellow because of company branding, but um, <laughs> bright red, bright orange, bright yellow. Um, yeah, I know there's trends to buy a white ski suit, but uh, you're just going to disappear in the snow. Any of those bright colors, honestly, the, uh, the rescue team, some of them have an orange hood. It's a, you know, the team color on the jacket but with an orange hood. And when we're hoisting them or long lining them and you look down that orange, that, that kind of neon orange just glows. Summer or winter, that color is great. So yeah, any of the brights, but, but that orange really works well. Nice, thank you. So not white, which is perfect. I didn't think so anyway. <laughs> great. Well, thanks so much, Jarrett. That was great. We really appreciate it. Um, all of us who see you fly over us. Um, some of us know you're up there and and we appreciate all those people that you bring home to safe, safe and sound, back to their families, back to their friends, and provide closure for others. So uh, we really appreciate what you do, and thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. As we move on to our third speaker, I wanted to introduce a friend, uh, uh, BJ Shute. He's 27 years with BC Ambulance. 
11 years as paramedic chief, 10 years with Squamish Search and Rescue in the Sea to Sky Corridor, SR manager and VP, vice president. He's a backcountry enthusiast, mountain biker, avid skier, uh, and he's seen his fair share of search and rescue incidents. There's no question in that region. From lost hikers and injured mountain bikers to disoriented backcountry skiers, and snowmobilers needing help in, in uh, treacherous terrain. So, you know, I'm proud to call BJ my friend and I'm really grateful that he's here tonight. He's dedicated his career to emergency response, emergency management in one of the busiest regions for search and rescue in BC and in Canada. So welcome BJ, good to see you. And uh, can't wait to hear what you've got to say here tonight. Thanks for having us, uh, Sandra, or uh, Squamish Stars. Uh, really proud to uh, to have been asked and to to join here. And I just wanted to uh, you know say thanks to the previous presenters, uh, Christine and Jared as well. It was very informative, and uh, I, I certainly uh, like hearing the common messages. And and uh, the you know uh, I was listening to the questions, and it's hard not to jump in and answer them because I I know from experience that. Uh, you know, Jared and I are, are on the same page and that are going to say exactly the same thing. And I'm, and I'm waiting for him to say something about a two-way texting SOS beacon. And, and there it was, the, the two-way beacons worked, worked great. So uh, good job, everybody. Um, I, I was asked to, um, you know, present uh, our perspective on, on hiker safety and, and what are some of the things that people can do in order to be prepared. And, you know, and I do like the fact that um, Adventure Smart has gone away from just saying be prepared to actually giving some preparation messages because prepared means something different uh, to each person and and so I, I I dug around and I and I found some some pictures this uh, this helicopter is red it's, it's not yellow sorry Jared but um, it uh, depicts a, a young lady there in purple and and this was a call and what what you're not seeing in this in this picture is the time of day and it's about it's about now where we only had about 20 minutes of flying time and Jarrett talked about how difficult and, and how long the nights can be if uh, if we aren't able to fly this this incident here was up at an area called Petkill Lake which is a, a couple hour hike um, just south of Squamish there uh, by the gondola that takes you up over top to a to a lake and and some people became stranded in the snow uh, and as you can see wearing jeans and a jacket and a hoodie with a um, I'm not even sure what we call it. There's some sort of uh, backpack type um, thing there that, that basically was empty. The only thing really that um, her and her friend who didn't have a backpack uh, took was a 500 milliliter bottle of water. But um, you can see the, the footwear, uh, they ran into snow, they got wet, they got stuck, they slid down the snow, uh, they couldn't really do anything about it. It doesn't do a good job of showing how wet and how cold they were. Um, but uh, certainly those genes didn't uh, didn't help. And the one thing that they didn't have was, that we talked about a lot tonight, was any sort of light source, whether that be a flashlight or preferably a headlamp with some extra batteries that they would have been able to make their way out uh, of the trail had they had to had they hike, had to hike. And what you see in the foreground, one is our pilot, the other was a SAR member with a, about a 45 or 60 liter pack. And what's inside that pack obviously is, you know, some, uh, excuse me, some first aid gear, a little bit of rope gear to help with, um, you know, a hand line to assist these people. But mostly what's in there is extra down jackets, toques, lights, um, some food and water for the people that uh, that were lost so that we can get them warm and get them comfortable before walking them out. And it would probably be about a, probably with them, it would have been about a four hour, maybe even a five hour hike out had, uh, had we not been able to fly them out. Um, in this case, we actually landed uh, downslope from them on a uh, on a logging road. Uh, they they did walk out for about half an hour to a logging road, and we just made it back to uh, to Squamish Airport before um, before we had to land for the night due to uh, due to the flight rules. Can we swap the the slide there? So again, um, this uh, this person in the foreground here, we gave them the headlamp that they have and. And uh, what, again, you don't see is the, the poor choice in footwear, clothing, and there's no backpack whatso whatsoever here, so no gear. Uh, down below them is one of our, one of our uh, rescue volunteers. And this, is, um, this was some lost people on a trail that goes up to the gondola. So again, it was about a, in the daytime, it would be 
you know, maybe a two hour, hour and a half hike out with somebody that's inexperienced. You can see the ropes that they set up there to get them down. Uh, I think this took about four and a half or five hours to um, to get these people out. So I think that um, the listeners are, and our viewers here are seeing a common uh, or hearing a common thread. I hope that, uh, you know, footwear, clothing choices and lights are are something that we heard from Christine, from Jared, and that you're going to hear repeatedly from myself. Um, those are the those are the things that really are going to make a difference and, and make your hiking adventure, your day adventure that's become an, a night adventure, something that's very tolerable and, and likely something that you can handle on your own and not need to activate search and rescue through the 911 system. It's really, you know, experience comes into uh, into play for sure in practice, but it, it's really, really important that people uh, are prepared and, and prepared to the point of self-rescue and, and having something simple like a a puffy coat or a vest, a toque, a buff maybe instead of a toque, some proper footwear and a light and a little bit of food and water, just how far that can go, even if it's just to keep your spirits high and, and keep you warm through the night if we're not able to access you, uh, either by hiking up or flying uh, until the next day or sometimes even two or three days later, in our case here in Squamish due to our terrain. Um, let's see what's on the next slide there. So yeah, some common themes we, we've heard. Um, you know, we heard from from Jared and Squamish SAR is very similar. We don't do as many calls as uh, our friends in North Shore, but um, certainly we do over 100, about 130 per year. And most of those calls are for rescues for people that have, you know, sustained some sort of trauma, whether it's mountain biking or hiking or skiing or climbing or uh, parasailing or some of the wing sports that we do here in Squamish. But of the of the people who are lost or, or missing, you know, there are some common themes and, and one of the big common themes we hear is that I didn't expect to get lost. So I didn't bring a jacket, a light, uh, you know, I didn't wear uh, good footwear because I thought I was only going to be going for a 20 minute walk or I didn't have, uh, my friend didn't bring a headlamp because I had one. And these are, these are very, very common, common themes. And I'll, I'll go so far as to say uh, somewhat frustrating to hear over and over again because the the literature and the and the and the work that Adventure Smart and in Squamish our prevention teams do is, is hammering these messages home and and everything. So, uh, a little bit of of research and a little bit of time, like what we heard Christine say, is to you know to read the book and to look at a map and practice your mapping and practice putting on your jacket in the dark and practice turning the light on and on. Does it have a lock switch? Does it have a flash mode? Does it have red? Does it have green? And and so fumbling around in the dark probably shouldn't be the first time that we're trying to trying to turn that headlamp on. Some other things we we heard is that um, we didn't expect for it to get so dark and be so cold. And that's something that we try and and hammer home to our volunteers and certainly to the people that we're talking to in the community is that we really want people to start to think uh, wet, cold, and dark. And what is it that you can do to alleviate the wet? the cold and the dark. Um, do you have a tarp or a rain jacket? Do you have a puffy jacket or a fleece jacket or a vest? And do you have some sort of light source? Um, and again, uh, Jared talked about uh, headlamps versus things like uh, glow sticks. Um, it's, you can navigate obviously with the glow stick. Um, you know, I know that there's people that do it and train to do it, but it's really not the best. And they're really we use them a lot in the, in the night operations for marking trails, for example, or marking uh, routes that we searched or uh, throwing them into the river to see how the current goes like that. We don't use them for navigational purposes in the sense of using them as a light. And, you know, that we didn't expect to need a light or food or water and warmth. And I think if you just take a few minutes before your adventure and you think, what if it gets dark? What will I do? What if it gets cold? What will I do? And what if it gets uh, wet. What can I do to help myself? And and then your your hike goes from, you know, a, a, an emergency to to somewhat of an unplanned camping adventure and a, and a really fun story to take home to your family family and friends. So, um, I think there's another slide. Again, some tips we talked about uh, researching your hike, and this is something that uh, you know we're trying to trying to bring forward a, a little bit more is to spend 
some time. So if you are looking at, uh, you know, Christine's website, for example, and you find a, a hike up here, I mentioned Peckill Lake, uh, doing a Google search of Peckill Lake and reading the comments, then you might find something within the last couple of weeks where the snow line is or the weather and checking the sunset and where do you park and what does the trail look like and how long does it take and those sorts of things. And uh, as well as practicing with online, online type maps or apping or sorry app um, uh, app software so a uh, Gaia for example or my maps or any of the free maps are, are great they're amazing you simply uh, turn it on and follow the blue or the red or the green dot around on the trail and it's really really a, a great navigation tool Google Maps however Google Maps is great if you're going for a bike ride in the city or you're trying to uh, find your kids daycare in downtown Vancouver or Surrey. It's really, really amazing tool for an urban adventure, but it's not a very good tool for a backcountry or front country um, uh, adventure. And we certainly don't recommend Google Maps as a, as a mapping source uh, here in Squamish. And I would go so far as to say any of the trails in the in our province here. One of the uh, one of the things that uh, we do notice, and I think anybody who's been to any of the outdoor stores. Uh, we have an escape route here and a Valhalla Pure that are amazing stores and is that uh, gear is flying off the shelf. Uh, the outdoors have exploded, whether that be hiking or paddling or biking or or whatever the sport is that you're going to take uh, take part in. But when we rescue people, they have a first aid kit. Uh, Christine mentioned that how they're not uh, the best. I, I tend to agree uh, with her on that, but they're still sealed. Um, you know, the stove is still in, a, in the cardboard box. And it's really, really, really important that people um, take some time and practice with this emergency gear. And I liken it to either your first aid kit in your car or the fire extinguisher under your seat. And the first time you pull that fire extinguisher um, out from underneath your sink shouldn't be when your stove is on fire or your house is on fire. It really should be something that is, that is uh, you know, muscle memory and something that you're able to do quite easily. And the same thing goes with your gear. Um, Bander, I think, talked about uh, the essentials and, and the gear the, the gear that you should have. And I think it's it's important. We talked about uh, what to carry in, in Christine's uh, presentation and, the, and how much and how much water and that sort of thing. And I think that just comes with some experience. You know, when you first start out, you might take, you know, a lot more Gear than you normally would and and different gear so you know every time you go out check that list make a list what did I use what didn't I use and and more importantly what did I wish that I had and if you get into a situation where you're hiking here in Squamish say it's up the chief and you get somewhere you know, oh I wish I had an extra granola bar or I wish I had better footwear that's the time where you can start customizing your your kit and the time that you can start looking at the different types of gear that you need for the different types of activities that you take and it really is a very simple thing that can be done after each hike or the next night after after a hike or with your even better with your hiking partners so that you guys can have a little debrief what went what, where did you go did you go where you thought you were going to be you know how does our gear work how, how what didn't work what can we do better next time what kind of food did we like? We didn't like this type of food, et cetera. How did the stove light? You know, was it snow on the ground? Did we have lots of water? All those are, are questions that you, you probably want to have and, and have a debrief, you know, in the comfort of your own home and not on the, the side of a snowy mountain somewhere where you're wishing you uh, had brought, brought the lighter because you, you didn't know your stove uh, didn't come with, uh, with an igniter or something along those lines. I don't know if there's another slide. I can't remember. Um, Else's. Oh yeah, how how to help us help you? This is um, something that uh, that we feel is is important. The first thing to remember, and we talked about calling 911, which is the second bulletin there. But calling 911 early, and by calling 911 or pushing the SOS button, which is really just the longer version of 911, that gets you a guaranteed and coordinated response by all the emergency services. So. For us here in Squamish, for example, you might get a response from the Squamish Fire Department, BC Ambulance, the RCMP, and Squamish Search and Rescue. We all work together at a common common goal to bring the, the person back safely or to treat them in the backcountry and evacuate them as more, most efficient as we, as we possibly can. And it's really important, the idea of being charged for your rescue 
should not ever hinder you calling 911. There's, there isn't a recognized search and rescue team anywhere in the province, I go so far as saying anywhere in Canada, that would ever ask for donations or money up front during or after a rescue. All of the search and rescue teams in British Columbia are volunteers. We do, however, rely on donations. So after a rescue, for example, you know, if somebody is feeling generous and wants to make a donation uh, to the team to, you know, help further equipment costs or training costs or fuel costs, those sorts of things. Um, those are gladly accepted, but no team would ever send you a bill or ask you to pay upfront for any any of our rescue services are 100% free. And I, I would stand and, and argue against anybody who uh, would advocate differently. Uh, we, we know that we have a, a robust and, and uh, dedicated, uh, strong search and rescue um, um, service here in the province. It's also really important that you stay you stay put. Uh, we did a call here two or three days ago for a, a young lad who fell over his handlebars and broke uh, broke his I think it was broke his arm. And you know his friends and and uh, the people that came by found him, called 911, gave us the location. It was it was perfect. We talked to him. We could verify the location, and uh, we started started our teams out, the fire department started out, the ambulance started out, and then some uh, people came along and, and they, they, they were very helpful. I don't mean to sound otherwise, but they walked them out a different uh, trail. And uh, and when they, they got to the roadway, the ambulance wasn't there. And, that, and that's because uh, they started moving and didn't tell anybody. So once that, uh, once that call 299 or 2911 is made, uh, and if you do request search and rescue, uh, most teams I think operate the same way, but whether it's a SAR manager like myself or another search and rescue member will call you back and make contact with you, provided you're in cell phone range, and we'll discuss that rescue beforehand. So we'll let you know how long it's gonna be, any advice we can uh, give you to stay warm or to move to a slightly better location or to, uh, treat somebody's injuries or, or any of that sort of stuff. And so once that rescue starts, it's very important that you that you go along and do the things that are being asked of you by that that rescue volunteer because they are giving you uh, the best advice and they're giving the, the advice that, uh, that on the backside that they're coordinating with their team to make sure that that rescue comes to you. The other thing that we're asking people again is to to have enough gear and we talked about knowing how to use it uh, to stay warm. Uh, you know, staying warm, and it doesn't it doesn't matter to me if it's uh, you know June first or August first. Um, you know, if I go this this morning when I went for a hike up the chief, I had a, a puffy jacket and uh, and a clean toque with me so that I could put on something dry and something warm when I got to the top because I knew I was going to try and take in the view and have a sandwich and and be up there. You know, after exerting myself for an hour and, and being uh, quite sweaty and quite cold and standing around in the wind that uh, that I'd be cold otherwise. So, you know, it uh, it doesn't take a lot to, uh, like I said earlier, to keep your your adventure going and to keep, uh, you know, what could be a disaster to to uh, a fun story that you're going to tell, going to tell your friends. So um, I'm not sure if there's, uh, I don't think there's any more slides. I'm not sure if there's any other uh, if there's any questions in the queue, or if there's anything, Sandra, that I that I missed that you want to, that you wanted me to cover as well, I'm happy to to stay on as long as uh, as long as people like. Awesome, thanks a lot, PJ. Yeah, we definitely have some questions in the queue. Uh, Krista is I asking. I answer them. <laughs> I'm interested in learning about orienteering, but not sure where to start. Any recommendations? Thanks. Uh, I'm not an orienteer myself, so I, I I can't help you, but I I do have some friends that do it. Um, I don't know what the uh, the app are, but I know that there's some some apps, and if you if you do a quick Google search, you'll find it quite quite quickly. And if by orienteer you mean either just learning how to to use a map and compass or or some navigation tools, or my suggestion would be to take it a step further and and join either an online geocache type group or uh, or one of those apps where people do geocaching. I think that's a great way, especially um, I do it with my nieces and, and nephews where um, where we'll, we'll go on to these sites and, and get the GPS coordinates and then I and then I let them navigate to to the stump and they can dig up 
you know, it's usually a box with some sort of trinket in there and you sign the book or, or follow the directions in the box and you rebury it or re, or re put it back to where it was and then you go on to the next one. And it's actually quite fun and it's a, it's a very good skill to, a very good skill to use and, a, and an easy way to, and a fun way to use that skill. So I hope that answers the question. If not, uh, feel free to retype something in there and I'll try and try and narrow it down for you. Thanks a lot. Uh, we have a question from Barb. She says, which online maps do you recommend? You know, I knew this question was going to happen and I was trying to figure out a way to not answer it because I didn't want to get in trouble with all the other mapping people. But um, there's a couple of ones that I, I particularly like. I like using a map called Gaia. I believe it's G-I-A, G-I-A-I, -I, something like that. You can find that. Um, as well as Trail Fork. Trail Forks is um, for here in Squamish because there are so many mountain bike trails and I suspect in, in uh, the North Shore, uh, well, I, I grew up in the North Shore, I know that there's a lot of mountain bike trails there too. Uh, Trail Forks is great and they've, they've bridged off into doing uh, other activities outside of mountain biking. So a lot of the common hiking bike or hiking trails are on there. And one of the features that, that I really like about um, about trail forks and i think it's absolutely brilliant that the uh, creators put this in here and they did work with with some of us uh, in the search and rescue world to do so is that in, in the menu function of trail forks when you open open the app in the top left corner of the menu it'll it uh, uh, there's a button there that says emergency info and if you it's a big red button if you push that it allows you to share your location either by email or text and we'll oftentimes use this um, for say mountain bike injuries and, and have that person text us the location. And then the Trail Forks app actually goes and digs into your phone and retrieves your GPS data off that and it texts it to the rescuer. And what I really like about that is that it's giving us a fairly accurate location. Um, but when I open it on the on my side, it's opening in the Trail Forks app or on the computer in Trail Forks and it plots that person's location onto the correct trail. So we're all looking at and talking about the same thing and there's no, uh, there's no transcription errors. Um, most teams, if not all teams in the province, certainly all the Sea to Sky teams and, and the North Shore teams can, um, can actually send out a text message and retrieve that GPS data off your phone. It's not live tracking like you would see on some of the TV shows. It just gives us a one time text message with the GPS location, um, which is also super useful, but then we have to go and transcribe it onto our map. So if we are in an area where we know Trail Forks is, uh, has, is inundated with trails, we'll, we'll Trail Forks will be our go-to uh, for that 100%. Awesome. And this is a great question from Melissa. Tips for, or tips for convincing people who don't think a full kit is necessary for a 7k hike. I'm committed to it, but my partner often wants to leave their extra layers behind when it's a warm summer evening. Sorry, I missed part of the question because my dog was... Uh, That's okay. Sure. I'll reread that. No worries. Something so, about how to convince people to carry the right essentials, I think. is the So thing. tips for convincing people who don't think a full kit is necessary for a 7k hike. Oh yeah, like a 7K hike is a long ways to go. So I guess my my response would be is, uh, you know, obviously it's going to depend on the elevation. But for example, uh, the, you know, here some of our hikes are about two, it's about a two-hour hike straight up a hill on a on a 7K hike. So, you know, if it took you, uh, you know, two two and a half hours, three hours to do that hike, you have to think it's going to take us two hours to do that hike. Plus we're carrying gear. Plus we have to page the team out. Plus we have to find you. Plus we have to do a whole bunch of other stuff. So, um, you know, I, I think it's it's important to um, to take this stuff with you, regardless of the the length of hike. I I go, um, you know, on, on short hikes here all the time, and you know, I I have sort of a two kind of go to um, systems that I that I use for each one. I have a, a like a it's a larger size, but a running vest that I have enough stuff in there where I can put uh, some communications, a cell phone charger, a uh, little bit of food, water, a vest or a puffy and a toque. And, and that's what I use if I'm going to go on like a shorter, say couple hour um, 7K hike. But if I'm going to do anything farther than that, then I take a full backpack that has a um, little bit more, a um, little bit more kit stuffed inside there for sure. Uh, the other thing, uh, you know, I was thinking about this this morning as well, is that uh, it's, you know, it, it, I may get some pushback from some other people, but depending on 
your knowledge, your skill level, and where you're going. So, you know, I, I have a, a fairly intimate uh, knowledge of the Squamish Trail. So, you know, I don't necessarily carry a paper map as a backup. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't ever look at, you know, I shouldn't say ever, but I very rarely look at, um, uh, look at maps when I'm, when I'm out recruiting just because I have that, uh, that sort of in-depth knowledge of where I'm going. So it, it can make a little bit of a difference, but I would say certainly, especially when you're, when you're starting out and, and, uh, and heading out that you need to have that little bit of, that little bit of gear just in case you know that not even the worst thing happens but you twist your ankle and you're stuck lined in a puddle or you're you know it's pouring rain or or the other side is baking hot um you know what um with our uh you know our body temperatures being what is it 36.5 or 36 uh, whatever for a, is a, our body temperatures but it's it's eight degrees at night. So that ground that you're laying on is eight degrees and it's sucking all that heat out of, out of you. So you want to be able to be warm and you want to be able to be comfortable until help arrives. So uh, I don't know about how you actually convince that. In, in this case, I think this was a, this was a couple other than, uh, you know, the, the bottom line is uh, everybody needs to go out there and be prepared and, and be prepared to the point of self-rescue every time you go out 100%. That's great. Um, so you kind of touched on this at the end of this last answer, but Kat's asking, uh, do you recommend physical maps at all? Um, and if so, any recommendations? Uh, she says she's not, doesn't, uh, or they say they don't really know how to use a compass very well. So I learned in well, Avalanche and I took my Avalanche training. Uh, I took my Abbey level yeah. one and got a crash course in map and compass reading and have been sort of playing totally. with it ever since. So. And I think that's, you know, and I think that's the key. And I, I go back to my comments about the fire extinguisher. If you don't know how, how to use it, then, then really why is it in, under your kitchen sink? And so, you know, carrying a paper map is, yes, uh, there are uh, great paper maps. I, I don't know all of them, but a lot of the places like Garibaldi Park here in Squamish, they have uh, a map. I think Joffrey has one as well that's specific to that area. And that's, that's a very good map. And it's uh, going to give you the, uh, the detail that you need to, to find your way out of, certainly on the main trail. But, uh, you know, taking that time to learn how to use it and learn how to use the compass is just as important as having the, is, if not more important than having the tool. There's even a, there's even great apps on your phone for a compass. But uh, again, as much as we rely on our phones, we should also ensure that we have an extra battery and a charger with us so that we can have the ability to charge that phone back up. And, and bear in mind that, uh, you know, technology can fail and also that, uh, you know, cold temperatures have, uh, uh, they can wreak havoc on a on a battery life as well. So we want to make sure that we're that we're covered. Um, I do take uh, a paper map, for example, when I go ski touring up here in Garibaldi Park. It just sits in my pack. It doesn't take up any any space. So I, we we do use them and we do recommend them for sure. Excellent. Uh, well, that is the last question. Just and I'm cognizant of everyone's time. It's 8:28, so we've done quite well. Um, so I just want to thank you, uh, BJ, for joining us this evening uh, and giving us your expertise. It was really great. I'm going to let Sandra sure. sign off this evening, and then I'll be ending the webinar. Thanks, Natasha. Thanks, BJ. It was awesome. It's nice to to hear your voice again and hear what you have to share. It's, you know, you're on the ground. You do this all the time. Uh, and have been doing it for a really long time. So I'm really glad that whoever joined us tonight from the public could learn from you um, and Jarrett and Christine and get some different perspectives. That was the whole idea behind this. And and I have one little question for you, um, but I think I know the answer, but personally, what do you, <laughs> of course I have a question. Uh, do you think it's a plus or a negative, a pro or a con? uh that we have such easy access to incredible terrain i know my thoughts but you know as a first responder as a paramedic yeah. who's kind of eats breathes and sleeps this is that easy access a really is it is it a good thing yeah it's you know it's a bit it's a bit of a loaded question so thanks for that you know it, it is a, it is a good thing because i'm i on one hand i'm i'm happy that people are getting out and adventuring i i am uh, a little bit concerned about the lack of awareness uh, on some of the, the more easy trails here in Squamish such as you know Mirren Park for example it, it, you know and just the, the, the there seems to be a, a a little bit of an attitude of, of not taking that 5 10 15 minutes just to to step back and look at a map and and having the ability to call uh, 911 where you know search and rescue has has in, in our minds become the fourth uh, emergency service here in the province and it's very easy to to rely on search and rescue but 
you know we are here we're, we're we're happy to help we, we join this team we uh, on a, they are we are volunteers and we do this because we enjoy it and we do it because we want to bring our skills and our knowledge uh, to assisting people that are in trouble but uh, on the same token i think there needs to be an onus on people to take some of that responsibility back on themselves and ensure that they are going out there um, prepared um, it you know it's uh it, it is a it is a, a blessing and a curse in the same sense and, and it is you know we do have amazing um terrain that's it's great it's easy to get to i go right out of my back door and i can be mountain biking in in less than less than two minutes you know i couldn't ask for anything more but i also understand that i have a responsibility to uh, to my community and to the, the greater community to do so uh within the um, within the training and within the abilities that I have and to be uh, reliant on myself first and, and search and rescue last. That the search and rescue should be our last line of defense. It shouldn't be the go-to because, uh, um, you know, we didn't uh, bring a jacket or we didn't bring a granola bar or a bottle of water. It's, it's very, very simple. I think uh, we heard it over and over again from, you know, myself and uh, Jared and Natasha, as well as you, uh, Sandra, through, through your work in Adventure Smart that, uh, um, it, it's pretty easy, especially in the summertime, to, to fend off cold, wet, and hungry. So I think we can we can tighten that down uh, quite a bit. So I'd be interested in what your thoughts are. Yeah, I agree. And I think I started off the, the thing tonight is saying that I think it gives people a huge false sense of security when we have that easy access, and it's and it's and it's mm -hmm. um, people are fooled by it when they when it's so easy to get to, they don't automatically go into that preparedness mode and make that plan and leave it with a trusted contact. And they they don't always, some do, I'm not, I'm not dissing everybody. Some don't though. Um, and, and, and at times it's, it's, it's not always a fault because I, I, I like to describe that user group as really they're unaware and many people are unaware and that's why we get to do this. And that's why we brought you on tonight and the others. And that's why we do this as a full-time job because there's so many people that have that access, especially on the South coast, especially down here in the Southwest. Yeah. And, and they are often we, fooled we by find the access. So it, we are, you know, and we look at, um, you know, the terrain that we have here in the in the Sea to Sky region and, and the the North Shore where where you know where I grew up. And it, it began, it's you know within within you know a 15 minute run or a five minute mountain bike ride. I I can the amount of, of terrain that we can that we can travel and the trail networks that we have there. They're just so advanced, and and they can be so confusing to people that we just really uh, we do want people to just just take that that time to uh, you know to uh, to to be prepared. We were we were chatting uh, just before we started here. I said when I joined uh, Squamish SAR in 2010 or 2011 or whatever it was, we did 52 calls a year, and now we're up to 130. And you know it's not that. Uh, that people are are making, you know, twice as many um, bad decisions. There's just so many more people that are out there and recreating. And the the one thing that I know for certain of almost 30 years in emergency services is that when we put more people into an area, more bad things are going to happen. And and that's what uh, what we're there to do. So I, I'm really glad that uh, that uh, our you know the province has uh, has taken on a, a key role in in funding the Adventure Smart program. And I wish that there was a way that we could drive people to those simple messages. It's just so so simple that, uh, that you know I, I almost think we, we we don't need to do these presentations, but clearly that we do because we need to drive that message home to to these people and and uh, you know we need to start early, which is what we we do here in Squamish. We meet, we um, do presentations in the schools and and you know you don't graduate uh, you don't graduate high school in, in Squamish without having an adventure smart presentations. We're we're really fortunate to have that buy-in by our school district in our community and it, it makes a makes a big difference um you know with uh with people and so it uh it, it's a it's a really important message and I and I hope that uh the people took something away from that. So thank you for having me. Yeah an excellent point and and I'll conclude on two points and just to let everybody know that in, in, and I think you knew this when you registered uh, for everyone who's listening that 50% of all hiking search and rescue occur in the southwest and that's why we wanted to kick off our summer series with the southwest tonight um, and then Thursday and next Tuesday and Thursday we rotate to other regions but this one is is the most impacted actually and that's why we wanted to invite you and have you share with us and 
and, and there are other opportunities to learn. We have our weekly webinars, and a great example is we have outdoor educators who are out there, some who are not with Search and Rescue, some who are. BJ's fortunate enough to have two there that are that are so busy with outdoor education. Christine and Cheryl have been incredible, and they've delivered more Adventure Smart presentations in the school system in Squamish than anyone elsewhere in BC. So they can be commended, and I like to thank them on behalf of myself again, and, and 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 we have over 500 outdoor educators in BC that we've trained. So we're really fortunate to have a support system. We have SAR Response, BJ, and the other 2,499 volunteers. Yeah. Uh, and then we have, uh, and that, was, that was good, wasn't it? It was good math, easy math, uh, thank goodness. And then we have outdoor educators who also do the outdoor education piece. You know, we do this as a full-time mm -hmm. job. Natasha and I and my crew here, and then we have 500 volunteers who wanted to join us and share it as well. So we have opportunities for that too. But thanks, BJ. It was a pleasure as always. Thank you. As always, enjoyed my time. Thanks. And thanks, everybody. I, I appreciate it. Hope you have a great evening. If you wanted to join and check more out with what we're doing um, this Thursday, we have another special event. We've got the Interior and Kootenays region with some special guests from Kimberly, Search and Rescue, uh, Wild Safe BC, just as two of those special guests. And then coming up next week, we have um, Vancouver Island and Northern BC with wonderful guests there as well. Um, and, and that will be really exciting to kick off the summer together provincially really about hiking safety because it is our main main cause of search and rescue and and we know that by now that you've by you getting informed you can make a difference and help us so remember to trip plan train take those essentials use the adventure smart trip plan app ask us if there's anything else we can help you with and have an excellent safe summer ahead thanks for your support good night